Uh, good afternoon once again. I welcome you all to our session on the bi-weekly presentation at the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies. Every fortnight, we have interesting topics to treat here on this platform, which is uh, the purpose of the platform. This is to have a uh, research activities and uh, presentations to increase the knowledge of everyone in migration studies and global studies. So I am Yuri Neto, the director of the center, and on behalf of my vice chancellor at the National Open University of Nigeria, Professor Olufemi Peters, I welcome you to today's session, which is going to be uh, presented. The topic for today will be presented by one of us, our very own, our own staff, who is in diaspora, and we are happy to have him with us. And that is no other person than Dr. Eric Omazu. And uh, I'll quickly introduce him briefly for those of us who don't know him to know him. We are very proud of him. Dr. Eric Omazu holds a PhD in philosophy from the Inamdi Azikiwe University, Oka, here in Nigeria. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy. National Open University of Nigeria, as well as a Ted Fund Morgan Fellow. He is currently undertaking the Ted Fund Fellowship in Morgan State University, Baltimore, in the United States of America. He has published articles in learned conference proceedings, journals, and edited books. He is the author of The Last Requiem a novel published in the United States of America since 2011. He has served the National Open University community in many capacities as member of committees and head of units. He has equally served as a special assistant to the vice chancellor of the university. Dr. Mazu is a prolific writer and a critical thinker his philosophical interests span such areas as metaphysics, ethics, philosophy of science, political philosophy, philosophy of development, and African philosophy. He is married and is blessed with children. His topic today is titled Exploring Diaspora Work Ethics Issues in Nigeria's Development. So I am happy to have Dr. Mazu here. And uh, I say, welcome on board, Dr. Mazu. And over to you to make your presentation to us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm saying good morning because I, I'm presenting <laughs> from the United States of America. And then I know I should be saying good afternoon to everyone. Yeah. My gratitude to you, the Director of Center of Excellence in Migration and the Global Studies. Thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. And then uh, I've also seen some people I must acknowledge for me to be able, before I'll be able to make this presentation. I've seen my boss, Professor Abdal Obadamo, is here. <laughs> I don't know what to say, his presence. Then I've also seen the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics, Professor Odiudumodjuma, Uduma. and then a host of colleagues and other persons who have come to listen or to participate in today's discussion. On Tuesday, on Tuesday, I, I I was in a meeting with someone, a director of an international organization in Washington, and uh, she's a Chinese. And we were holding some discussion. And uh, in the course of discussion, she wanted to show me the amount of progress China has made. You know, she said that while she was a kid, you know, that was about 40, 
or there about years ago. Her mother was earning $30 per month. $30, that was her mother's salary per month. But then the mother is dead. She's living in America, but then her relation, her sisters and brothers are living in China. Paid of them all received $10,000 in a month as salary, you know? So that when you look at their life, you will see that there is, a, there is progress, you know, from uh, progress and improvement in their income. Now, I made a mental calculation of Nigeria's own situation. And the what came to my mind immediately was the vice president uh, speech the other day, where he said that as an assistant lecturer in the uh, University of Lagos, he was earning 700 and something dollars, roughly. Now, an assistant lecturer in Nigeria does not earn $700 he earns about $200, you know, in the current scheme of things. What are these things? Nigeria has retrogressed. And then we've made an effort. We did not stop there. Uh, we, we didn't find ourselves where we are because we didn't make an effort. We did. We did. There are lots of developmental efforts made by Nigeria. You know, uh, all of us, we know so many of we still retrogress in spite of all those efforts, in spite of all those efforts. And uh, all of us are involved in looking for solutions in why we are where we are, in, uh, you know, why, you know, from what we have at home, what we have in Nigeria. So we begin to wonder. So for our problem, I have identified work ethics, you know, as one of the challenges that we have in Nigeria. Maybe that's the missing link. It could be one of the missing link on why we have not developed, why we have not advanced like other countries. Now, I'm going to look at the, how we are going to repatriate uh, the work ethics of diaspora people. At least I say it is in the short run. In the short term, the short term. But then in the long term, we as a country must make investment or invest in developing a long-term homegrown work ethics for our own development. Now, whether positively or negatively, that is whether we conceive African di di diaspora in negative terms or in positive terms, we must acknowledge that it is an agent of African development. So as a result of this, African diasporas are regarded in many, uh, are regarded as development assets because they bring development to the continent. They're also African major donors, you know, in a continent that uh, has six, has, that has five, five regions. The diaspora is now also regarded as the sixth region to show you how important they are. The diaspora account for between, 100 and, between 50 to $150 billion in remittance, in remittance flows across the continent. So every year, the diaspora bring in between 500 to $150 billion. This is a 2010 research done by Zeleza. The diaspora remittances, a proceeds of their work experience in foreign countries where they live and toil. With woodland income from natural resources and decline in foreign direct investment, many African countries look up to the diaspora remittance as source of foreign exchange earning. In Nigeria, the government enacted an act in 2017, which established the Nigeria Diaspora Commission need come. The overall duty of the commission is to explore and attract diaspora contributions to the development of Nigeria. Since its establishment, the commission has published some of its plans, which include 
the development of diaspora database. This database will serve as a vehicle of diaspora engagement with Nigeria. The different ways in which the database will handle the Nigerian diaspora include the following. Diaspora voting, diaspora mortgages for housing, incentive for investment with the Nigerian Diaspora Investment Trust Fund and Diaspora Bond, land and property allocation, political and community appointments and recognition, interventions and credit loans for agriculture and solid minerals through the Central Bank of Nigeria and Bank of Industry. Now, you must note immediately that many home-based Nigerians lack the needed resources to assess most of these opportunities which the federal government has offered to diasporians. This immediately raises some question for us. Why does this government offer the diasporas programs which the majority of home-based Nigerians cannot afford? There is only one answer to this. The diasporans have the capacity, they have the capacity to subscribe to those programs. Most people in Nigeria do not have the capacity to do so. Now, the question is, why do diasporans have capacity to invest in these programs, whereas Nigerians do not have the capacity to do so, even when the programs are being offered in Nigeria? Now, these are the issues I'm going to raise. And then I will show that the disparity in the economies of Nigeria and then foreign countries where the diaspora people live account for this difference. And then that the disparity in economic development or economies of nations is also due to disparity in ages of works this point has been demonstrated by Max Weber. And then I am also going to compare the works of the work, the ethics of work of foreign nations with that of Nigeria. And I will make an argument that there is need for an African centered work ethics. Designating the Nigerian diaspora. Now the question is, who is a Nigerian diaspora? I must recognize immediately that uh, the term diaspora is a problematic one. We find it difficult to define it. This is because it is difficult to designate what to include. For instance, I had when, uh, when the director of the center introduced me, he said I'm a diaspora. I'm not too sure. I'm not sure whether I'm a diaspora. I do not know whether I should count myself as one. So that's the question. These are some of the challenges that come with defining diaspora. Now, because of this difficulty, some scholars to, to descriptive roots in trying to define it. Zaleza, for instance, lists uh, 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 some of characteristics, and he said that it involves movement, movement, that is diaspora, involves movement. It also involves migration from one place to another. It also involves migration from homeland to hostland. Generally, migration plays an important role in the definition and classification of diaspora. Thus, the term Nigerian diaspora is descriptive of Nigerians who have migrated from Nigeria to any other part of the world, including parts of Africa. Colin Palmer, give us a timeline for such a migration that happened not only in Nigeria then, but for the entire African continent. The first of these 
or the first African diaspora was consequence of the great movement within and outside of Africa. This began about 100,000 years ago. The second major diasporic movement began about 3000 BCE with the movement of the Bantu speaking people from the region that is now Cameroon and Nigeria in Africa. The third major stream is character characterized loosely as a trading diaspora, and this involved the movement of traders, merchants, slaves, soldiers, and others to parts of Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, beginning around the fifth century BCE. The fourth major African diaspora stream, and the one most widely studied, is associated with Atlantic trade in African slaves. The fifth major stream began during the 19th century, particularly after, slave, after slavery's demise in the Americas and continues to our time. Now, I tend to argue, I argue that Palmer's mapping of diaspora is insufficient for the purpose of our paper. This is because the period he put together as the fifth major stream have very little or nothing in common in the context of Nigeria of 20 or with, the, with Nigeria of 2022. The reason is that Nigerian citizenship was non-existent in the 19th century up to mid 20th century. You must remember that we got our independence in, the, in 1960. So it is only after we got this independence that the idea of a Nigerian or Nigerian citizen began to emerge. And uh, we successfully amplified this in the 1999 constitution. According to our constitution, a person is a citizen of Nigeria by birth if he is born in Nigeria before or after the date of independence having either one of his parents or grandparents belonging to an indigenous Nigerian community. Now, what this means is that individuals who can successfully trace their origin to communities which constitute present day Nigeria, if they were born outside Nigeria and their parents or grandparents fail, fail to trace their roots to any Nigerian community, such a person cannot lay claim to being a Nigerian. Thus, I want to limit myself to the definition of a Nigerian diaspora in the context of, Niger of, a, of Nigerian as provided by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Accordingly, a Nigerian diaspora is a Nigerian migrant or descendant of a Nigerian migrant who is conscious of his or her Nigerian roots the idea of root, of root consciousness relates to the affinitive relation which the individual so defined holds with Nigeria. This could be in form of his interaction with his or her community in Nigeria. His association with other diaspora Nigerians in his country of abode his association with Nigerian government or its representatives in his country of residence, his or her association with an interest or interest in the affairs of at least one of the communities that make up Nigeria. So it's not just that you, you claim to be a Nigerian. Of course, you, you must remember what happened. Uh, there was a basketball competition between Nigeria and uh, Australia. And the Australian player, a black girl who have Nigerian roots, apparently her parents came from Nigeria. So while she was playing with Nigerian basketball female players, she told them, to do who can get back to their shit whole African country. Now, this such a person does not become a Nigerian diaspora simply because his or her parents are Nigerians. He must be, he or she must be conscious of his Nigerianness 
he or she must be able to make some connections to Nigeria. Now, there are some Nigerian diasporans I interacted with in America in the course of preparing this work. They demonstrate strong consciousness or affinity with Nigeria. They consider Nigeria as a beloved homeland to which they may never return. They complain of the state of underdevelopment manifest in high incidences of poverty, insecurity, lack of basic amenities, dysfunctional healthcare system, and comatose educational system. These are the things that account or the factors that account for their inability or lack of plans to return to Nigeria on any permanent basis. This is contrasted with the attitude of their children. Now, to their children, their parents are the only connection to Nigeria which they have. They have no memory at all about Nigeria. And they're not sure neither regrets nor plan of a return. It is difficult in our context to regard such person or such children as Nigerian diaspora. Now, Nigeria development challenge. I've told you the diasporans, for them, we have issues with development and not just for them, but then for every one of us, including you and I. And I begin by saying that Nigeria development is jinx. So many theories have been propounded about the reason why our development is jinx. One of them is the new Marxist explanation, which offered a theory of dependence. I hold that the, the, the dependency relation between the metropoles and the peripheries is the reason why most African countries, including Nigeria, is underdeveloped. This was the dominant theory in the 1960s, 1970s. Of course, this was during the era of colonialism. But then we cannot continue to reference colonialism uh, 60 years after we've gotten our independence. So many other nations like Nigeria, which got their independence in Asia, in Europe, you know, in uh, South America, in uh, North America, which got their uh, independence at the same period that we got our own. They have moved forward successfully, developing. So they're no longer blaming any person for their inability to, to develop. So we can no longer blame the dependency theory as responsible for our inability to develop. So as a result, scholars are now looking inward to get or to discover reasons why we have failed to develop. Now, some of the reasons that they offered include corruption. It also includes overestimation of the crude oil world, you know? We tend to think that we have crude oil, natural resources, and then that this money from natural resources will never end. It will always be there with us. It also includes our inability to industrialize. You know, so these are the reasons why we have development challenges in Nigeria. But then Nigeria has also not sat one place. Nigeria has made some effort in order to attend development. We must agree that Nigeria has done that. So there are very responses to the question why Nigeria has not developed. So Nigeria has responded to its development challenges by number one, expanding access to education. This was the mantra in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. In fact, in the 70s, we have uh, the first uh, universal basic education program so that every person should be educated. The hope was that once every person in Nigeria is educated, we will touch the sky. Now, there is also emphasis on STEM. 
we, we for us development is about what science technology engineering and mathematics can do so if we emphasize on this if we train so you know many people on this we will become a developed nation these were some of the steps that we took there were also indigenization policy through which governments took over companies owned by foreign interests you know we were claiming that the ownership of these companies by foreign interests were hindrances to uh, our own development. Then we also undertook what is called external borrowing, and uh, we have continued to engage in this. But unfortunately, we still have nothing to show for it after 60 years of independence. Under our Babangida government, we engage in what is called structural adjustment program. There is also the debt relief, which President Obasanjo pursued vigorously with the claim that debt servicing and debt repayment deprive us of the resources needed to pursue meaningful development. There is also increased taxation, you know, which the current government of President Buhari is pursuing with the argument that more taxes will free resources for government to pursue development. And then there is also reliance in diaspora remittance. Currently, the CBN pays some incentive to diasporans to remit money to the country. So any uh, $100 that somebody sends into the country, the CBN gives the person uh, 500 naira as an incentive. You know, So that when we have this money, we we'll have foreign reserve. And then when we have foreign reserve, our economy will be strong and we may become a developed nation. The diaspora has made great contribution to Nigeria's development. Now, recent scholarship have also recognized that there is increase in incidences of migration. This is attributed to cheaper transport and communication systems. And these have enabled people or poorer individuals to migrate from one area or from their area of poverty to a place of relative affluence where they hope to live a better life. Now, because most of these uh, developed nations are in the Western world, it is called the North. Undeveloped nations are called the South. So the migratory movement from the south to the north. People are moving from areas of poverty to areas of wealth, areas of, of uh, affluence, areas of employment. So they are pursuing better life for themselves. And then the belief is that the north has answered to their poverty. First, okay. According to NITCOM, the diaspora people, uh, the Nigerian diaspora is estimated as 17 million, 17 million people, you know, there are 17 Nigerian people, Nigerians who are in diaspora. Their contribution to Nigerian development is viewed in both negative and positive terms. First, as negative in, in negative terms, the diasporas are seen as responsible for the problem of brain drain with the devil developing nations, including Nigeria. Reference is often made to the high number of trained personnel and professionals who migrate from Nigeria to take residence in other countries. Attention is also drawn to the massive resources invested in their education by the country, which is going to be reaped by a foreign country. Even the diaspora remittances, which have been held as, as diaspora's greatest contribution to Nigeria development has also been cast in negative light. Among its highlighted shortcoming is the claim that it caused inequality among people. So that when the diaspora, diaspora people send in this money, they are relatives who receive them tend to live a better life in comparison to their neighbors. 
who have nobody, no person in diaspora to send this type of money, free money for them. So it causes inequality among the people. It also causes conspicuous consumption among the people to whom it is remitted rather than spurring them into productive investments. Nigerian diaspora are also sources of negative image for the country. You know, some of them find it difficult to break into the mainstream life of their host nations. As a result, they begin to engage in all sorts of crimes as survival mechanism. Viewed from this angle, diasporas contribute to underdevelopment. The diaspora remittances, now I'm talking about the positive contribution of diaspora to our development. The diaspora remittances, diaspora criticisms are also regarded as a major positive diaspora contribution to Nigeria development. The 2017 diaspora remittance to Nigeria, for instance, the figure is put as 6.1% of Nigeria's total GDP. This gives increasing importance to diaspora remittance as a source of foreign exchange. In fact, among African countries or in relation to Africa, diaspora remittance is regarded as the new foreign aid. Nigeria, for instance, received more diaspora remittance than the foreign aid is received from any country. Now, beside their foreign remit remittance value, diaspora Nigerians also bring their expertise or technical know-how to bear on the country. Most of them function as medical doctors, that is when they return, lawyers, professors, accountants, and so on. Diasporas in this category are those who made the often difficult de decision to return home. They broaden the service and productive industries by bringing their foreign training to bear on local conditions. In an interconnected world, diaspora Nigerians also serve as the easiest link between Nigeria and the outside world. Work ethics and economic development. In 1904, Max Weber, a German sociologist, published his great book, The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism. In that book, Weber established a strong relation, relationship between work ethics and development of nations in the capitalist era. At the core of Weber's thesis, is that the Protestant work ethics, with its privileging of individualism and hard work, was responsible for the 18th and 19th centuries industrial revolution of Europe. Weber's book inverted Karma's claim that situated capitalism as a historical process that only emerged during the industrial revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries. For Weber, Capitalism was an old system existing even in ancient societies of Egypt, India, China, Babylon, and even medieval Europe. It only took a new form. That is what Weber called modern capitalism during the Industrial Revolution. The old capitalism was simply a traditional regular orientation to the achievement of profit through economic exchange. Modern capitalism, on the other hand, involves a rational organization of formerly free labor. So labels that we are free in the past. Modern capital, capitalism rationalizes and organize it. Now, by rational organization of labor, Weber means is routinized, calculated administ administration within continuously functioning enterprise. A rationalized capitalist 
enterprise implies two things. One, a disciplined labor force, and then the regularized investment of capital. We must note that investment of capital without the corresponding disciplined workforce, Weber holds, is detrimental to any economy. Thus, econ economies grow to the extent that capital investment means a labor force amply imbued with the knowledge that the essence of capitalism is not just blind accumulation of wealth for its own sake. Rather, capitalism entails a tendency towards reproduction and reinvestment. And this is what drives development in the capitalist era. So Weber identified the protestant ethics as possessing the drive for reproduction and reinvestment, and therefore responsible for modern capitalism. He found the proof of this in the idea of the elect and predestination. The notion of the elect captured the biblical idea of the chosen. Protestants, especially Calvinists, believe that God has already chosen the saints. So there is nothing anyone can do to be chosen. Rather, the level of success which you attain in the present life is a proof of your being chosen by God. Now, this is contrasted with the Catholic ethics, which promoted monastic ascetism with, the, with its attendant disinterestedness in the affairs of the world. The simple implication of Weber's book is that work ethics play important roles in the success and failure of nations in the modern capitalist system. Now, there is a waning of the influence of religion in the Western nations. As a result of this, Protestant ethics has lost its hold over people. In a, in a class of uh, 30 people that I taught in Morgan, a course in ethics and values, I, I was asking students some questions I wanted to know, you know, an issue came up. Only two of 30 students said that they were Christians. One said he's a Muslim. The other person said they don't believe in anything. So for this type of people, when you project or present Protestant ethics to them, it makes no meaning. So consequently, emphasis is now placed on non-theistic ethics. Non-theistic ethics emphasize solely the role of reason in ethics rather than divine forces at the terminals of morality. Now, one important figure in this area of thinking is Anna Arendt. Anna Arendt. Arendt made distinction between two types of lives, what she called vita activa and vita completiva, the active life and then the life of contemplation. Now, while ancient philosophers, starting from Pythagoras, Plato, and so on, while those ones favored Vita Contemplativa. Marx was the first person that came and said no, that it is Vita Activa that should be favored. So he inverted what the ancient philosophers did. Now Arendt came and said that both of them are very important. Vita Contemplativa is, is important. That the active life is important and then the life of contemplation is important. But in terms of work, in terms of work, in terms of living in the world, and making, leaving our footprints in the world, that what is needed is vita activa. And he said that this active life is divided into three, the life of labor, the life of work, and the life of action. We are concerned with only two of these, labor and 
work. Now, labor is the survival routine of all animals, including human beings. That is what labor is. Every animal labors, and he, it labors because it wants to eat. It is instinctual for animals to go and do something to be able to eat. The process of doing this is what Arendt calls labor. Now, but work is different. Work gives collective meaning to what we do. It defines us. When we work to produce something, we both put something into and leave something lasting in the world, you know? So you can imagine what it, it takes you to write a paper. You can imagine what you have put inside into it. So you are putting something and then at the end of the day, you are also leaving something. This is what work, uh, uh, work is all about. And Aaron says that work is very important because we need it to leave our imprint. So what she says is that what work, what we work at makes us human beings. It also creates the human reality which all of us share. So what is part of work is what Aaron called the human artifice. It means that we are more than mere nature like other animals that level. So as we walk and we recreate ourselves in our work. Now, this type of thinking is the work ethics that animates work, employment, and productivity in developed countries. So people work, they make contributions because they want to live part of themselves. They also want to contribute in shaping this, their society because they think that their work defines them. The diaspora and work ethics for Nigeria. I have rummaged literature in search of Nigeria work ethics. I did not find any. Papers on work ethics in Nigeria are more of moral quotes without any philosophical reflection that will tra transform them into ethics. You know, there is, I'm now making a distinction between ethics, between ethics and uh, morality. Morality has to do with the codes that guide human behavior in societies. Whereas ethics has to do with reflection on these codes. So we have not really re reflected on the moral codes, on the codes of war that we have. Papers on work ethics in Nigeria are, are more of moral codes without any philosophical reflection that will transform them into ethics. Thus, it can be said that we have no work ethics, but we have morality of work which can be derived from the morality of traditional Nigerian societies. I buttress my points with the morality of work of Igbo society, which is animated by a proverb. Uh, I'm looking at the Professor Abdal Obad, our former VC, my own boss. It used to be a serious agreement between us because he will always tell me that these African proverbs are African philosophy. The, the proverbs can become philosophy when we reflect on them, when we reflect on them critically. Now, the book of proverb says that Akajaja Nebute Ono Manu Manu. When I translate this in English, I got the soiled hand fills the oily mouth or makes the mouth oily. More, uh, this is a better translation now. The soiled hand makes the mouth oily or oils the mouth. A hermeneutical interpretation of this proverb shows the connection between work and food. Thus, the essence of work is production of food. One who has gotten enough food needs not to work again. 
What he has should be stored in the barn, pending when he need when the need arises. This is the morality of work among the Igbos. It could be the same among other uh, Nigerian societies. I will need uh, uh, another opportunity to research and then do a survey to see what other Nigerian communities have. But then the point is that this type of thinking is responsible for the seasonal nature of work in traditional Nigerian societies. Foods are cultivated and harvested in certain seasons. Thus, there is time to soil the hand and another time to oil the mouth. This mentality is also taken into the corporate world. The worker does not view his work as in telling total dedication and commitment throughout the work period. He factors some time in between to rest, to gossip, and then to do other things, thus creating a season of work out of his daily work experience. Now, for us to make progress, we must be able to evolve a work ethics that transcends the simple question of walking to it. We must transcend it. Such an ethics or any ethics or morality of work that is built on the idea of walking to it is pedestal and holds no meaning outside the need for consumption. Our new ethics of work must be such that will drive us to compete with the already developed nations of the world. The first point of call for evolving a productive work ethics is the diaspora. We must be able to inquire from them the work ethics that animates work in their various locations. Now, the attempt is to distill what is good in those work ethics as a stopgap measure. In the long run, the ultimate solution will be to evolve a work ethics that will derive from the African person's vision of the world. The African's vision of the world is an intricate world where the essence of life is attainment of immortality as ancestors. I'm pursuing an ongoing work where I will try to evolve a work ethics from the African's vision of the world. But such a vision of the world will give the African a reason, a rational reason on why he needs to work. Instead of making his work a seasonal affair, it's going to be an all round. You can imagine a Nigeria where you don't need to, you don't need to wait for any season to eat corn anywhere in Nigeria. That is, that is the way it is. But here in Nigeria, we still do this thing seasonal. And this is part of what is affecting our development. Even the people who are giving you light, the Nepa, they will think this is time to give and then this is time to take. Everything happens seasonal. So we must be able to evolve an, a work ethics that takes us away from our traditional mode of thinking, from our traditional mode of doing things, which is seasonal. Conclusion, the diaspora remittance is a joyless endeavor. This is what I discovered in my interaction with the diaspora in America here. Often people at home believe that diasporas make remittance from the abundance. They do not know that these people squeeze resources and that they overwork themselves to be able to raise the money which they remit to Nigeria, you know? As staff of National Open University, you work 40 hours in a week, 40 hours. There are diaspora people who work 120 hours in a week. So every single period of the week they are working. Many a times I had diasporans complain that when they visited Nigeria, they were shocked that the people who they were, who were disturbing them for money were living better life than them. So this is one of their complaints. They also 
feel reluctant to send money for productive investment. So if the diasporans are sending money, they are just sending it to help their families, to help one or two person who is asking them for money. They are reluctant to send money for productive investment. Personal past experience or that of other diasporas discourage them from doing so. Because the argument is that the resources that they sent in the past were mismanaged, siphoned, or frittered away by trusted managers who have no idea of the requirements of his position as a manager. Now, my argument is that to kickstart our development, we must first of all inquire into the ethics of work that made the development of other nations possible. The diaspora holds the key for un unraveling this. In the long run, however, there is need for us to evolve an ethics of work that is rooted in the nature and vision of the world of the African person. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Omazu, for this wonderful presentation. I must say that uh, I presentation, and uh, in my own uh, little way, I said you were in the diaspora. Yes, I still maintain you have left your original residence or abode. And here, you both in language and culture, you are in a different environment. So you are in the diaspora. And I try to speak American language to you. I say you can't, when you were trying to know that all this is part of the, the fun of being in the diaspora. I also want to quickly say that um, I did not observe my orgas on duty uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation. So I really want to. Uh, recognize the presence of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics, Professor Duma Oji. Duma, you are welcome, sir. I'm happy to see you at this presentation, and I want you to always come around. We want to feel your presence on this platform. And then um, I'm also sending special greetings to our former professor, our former Vice Chancellor, Professor Abdallah, who is always with us at any time. We really appreciate your presence, sir. I want to also greet the Acting University of Dr. Uh, Okwala, Angela Okwala, you are welcome. Nice to see you. I greet my co-director, Mrs. Sinika, who has uh, accepted herself for accepted herself for a long time and is here today. You are welcome, ma. I greet uh, Professor Kagbare, Professor Tijani, and so many people online. Dr. Erima has Dr. Emima has disappeared for almost one year, and here he is today because he's Dr. Omazu's friend. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Akimboye, Dr. In Law. Sorry if I'm missing the name of all of you. All of you are really appreciate your presence. So I will not let the uh, space be open for questions. And I have seen Professor Abdallah with his hand raised up as number one, followed by Dr. Emina. So let's take it quickly because we gave the center enough time to present. We didn't interrupt him, but we are going to make this session of questions and answer and comments very, very fast. And we tell the presenter to remember to just take note of everything because he will give his response at the very end. Thank you very much. And over to you, Professor Abdallah, for your uh, contributions. Uh, thank you very questions. much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Well done. Uh, I expected no less. Uh, but it is now, after Eric has presented that, I realized my problem with this seminar series. Uh, and it has just opened up my eyes uh, to the fact that there is a world of difference between my perception of these things and uh, other people's perception. And it took a philosopher to, 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 to really draw my attention uh, to this. See, I'm a scientist. I'm an empiricist. I'm somebody who believes in the empirical world. And I like to see a correlation between cause and effect. And in most of these things, what we see are uh, what I can call theoretical postulations rather than raw, hardcore uh, data that drives the presentation and convinces people of their, their argument. But now I'm beginning to understand that when I'm dealing with philosophers and social scientists and uh, uh, you know natural uh, humanities people, the issue of uh, being precise and measured is, is not there. 
So let me just simply point out my concern. First of all, congratulations, uh, Eric. It's a very, very interesting area. I'm glad you are beginning to accept that African proverbs are a philosophy because you don't believe that. You said that there is no authorship. But then I gave you a book about the death of the author by Roland Barthes, oh, and yeah. uh, you have now accepted that, okay. yes, African philosophy, uh, African proverbs are, are, are indeed African philosophy. Now, my observation is I had expected that the arguments and the discussions about the diaspora, if they don't have any specific uh, 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 empirical data, and you gave some, uh, and that some you gave is perfectly fine with me because it is based on the theory of anthropology of experience. Uh, so even if you talk to one or two old people, that, that is perfectly acceptable. But I will have expected a, a harvesting of, of, of the data from other sources so that uh, we, we, could, we could see a richer, richer presentation. Let me, let me take the last bit, uh, work ethics. I would have loved to know whether the diasporans were affected by the work ethics of the situation they found themselves in. Because it's not, it's not really, what is really important is that if you have work ethics, whether you are Nigerian or Burundian or whatever it is, you are living in America, you are living in London, you are living in New Zealand. Are you affected by the work ethics of that particular environment? Because being affected by the work ethics in that environment shapes your morality, shapes, shapes your, 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 eth your, your ethical considerations. And so you, you jettison the Nigerian part of you. And now you, you become, that is why when people come back from America, even the way they talk, the way they expect things to be done is different. When you come back, we're going to be different. Your English is going to change. You are no longer going to speak, be speaking Anambra English. You'll be saying, yo, man, what's up? What's happening? You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, man. That's what you'll be saying. So my question is, to what extent do the diasporans adopt the, the work ethics of the environment that they, 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 they accept themselves? And to what extent is this adoption of the work ethics of the environment is sustainable when they come back to Africa? Uh, do they maintain that sustain, that that work ethic that they have they have got uh, that, that they have acquired? Secondly, I would have loved to see a comparison between Nigerian diasporans and Ghanaian diasporans and other diasporans because Nigerians are not the only ones in Abila. I mean, you said diaspora, okay? So I would like I would have loved to see how Ghanaians, Liberians, uh, you know, uh, Zambians, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, mesh well. Uh, with that. So if you are going to expand the paper, I think you might probably look at, uh, 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 at that. Your theoretical framework of work ethics is, is okay because your philosophy are looking at ethics. But I would have loved to see a framework that relies more on the human condition rather than on a particular branch of ethics, but the human condition that, that forced people to, uh, to behave in a particular uh, uh, manner. Because the human condition will not start putting people in a different, uh, in, a, in, a, in a difficult situation of whether they have to believe in God or not, like you talk to some of your, of, of your people. Uh, so finally, I will have, uh, you, you have a critical theory of developing state and the diasporans have all these issues about Nigeria. You know, they, are, uh, they, they show their inability and lack of willingness uh, to return to Nigeria because of this, because of that, because of that. Uh, people are chopping. We are on strike now. We, are, we need 18 billion. Uh, somebody is chopping 80 billion. And, uh, you know, just, just, just like that. Another person is, is chopping 47 billion. And then they now remove the one with 80 billion and then they put somebody else. And he also has some billions that are, he has chopped. So this is okay. This is Nigeria. But my, my focus is on their children. And you said that their children have no memory of Nigeria. They don't identify with Nigeria. They don't see themselves as, as Nigerians. And uh, if you give them a chance, they will probably even disown Nigeria and, and, and claim that they are not Nigerian. They don't identify conceptually, structurally, philosophically with the nation of Nigeria. How do we do that? Does that mean that the more diasporans give birth to children outside Africa, the more they lose their identity? So Africa is losing its identity. This is very, very critical to, 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 to us. Uh, and finally, 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 uh, finally, oh, we got light. Electricity is here. And that's another thing, you know, no electricity. And uh, that, that, that's it. Uh, uh, finally, this, this issue of, uh, of, yeah, brain drain and deacculturation, that, that's the issue. 
you have brain drain, people getting out. But then there is a third factor that you have not considered, the deacculturation. When diasporans come back to Africa, do they come back as Africans or genetically, socially modified Africans? That's, that's all for now. Thank you very much and well done. Thank you very much, sir. I, Dr. Erima, please let me uh, give the Deputy Vice Chancellor the opportunity to ask uh, his question before you. Sorry about that, just let him, because I know he must have a tight schedule. So over to you, DVC, Professor Uduma Uduma. Thank you, our director. Let me first of all thank my boss, Professor Abdallah Vadamu, for seeing you here again, sir. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Mike. Mazo. Ah. Dr. Mazo, you raised some issues that I really would want you to think through. Number one, you said that the evil morality of work is anchored on Aka Ajaja Nebuto on uh, Onu Manu Manu. And you said that if that is why our work is, the work procedure in Igbo land is seasonal. I have always argued against regionalizing certain practices because even if it has to do with eating, but Manu Manu in this context is not eating alone. But even if you want to see, it is not peculiar to the Ibos. You are a Christian, I know. When Paul said he, he ought not to walk, ought not to eat, did he reduce the whole of essence of walking to eating? Now, when the Ibos talk about man, man, they are talking about what glitters. And it is not only food. That could also talk, take care of so much beyond food. And so I see a kind of one relativism in your interpretation of that. And more particularly, we are talking about a monetary economy. And you are bringing what is anchored on an agrarian economy in a monetary economy. That creates a lot of problem. So I want you to, as you polish this apart, look through this and see how you can fine tune that aspect. Because if you talk about the Hebrews and the diaspora, the main thing underpinning them is this idea of Akurulu. I want you to look at the concept of Akurulu in talking about when, when the Hebrew man, for example, is working outside his environment. Is the, what is driving his, all that he's doing is the principle of Akurulu. That is why you talk about even when they don't give back again, because they want to see that their labors, their toil is reflected somewhere at home. So that when you begin to police, uh, police your work, try to look at these things and don't just make doc uh, some doctive uh, statements that do not hold. Thank you very much. So let uh, Dr. Emina please uh, ask his question, then followed by, I think, Professor Demo Kala. And I saw another person, but I can't see his hand up again. But Dr. Emina, please go ahead so that uh, Dr. Eric will note all the questions and take it all. I take them together, please. Okay. Is okay, this, Martha. Is okay. Yeah, I'm there. Thank you very much. I, I may not be able to take on the video now, but uh, Dr. Eric, I want to commend you for this brilliant presentation. Um, I, I'm concerned about um, your discourse on what dependency has actually done or being responsible for underdevelopment in Africa. And uh, I think maybe we need to, you need to expatiate more on that because if you look at uh, the global structure, global economic structure and what uh, it has done to Africa's development, we'll continue to understand that no matter the amount of work ethics that might be in place, that Africa will continue to be a dependent uh, 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 continent. Because there is this inequality in the global structures, which is deliberate, you know, deliberately done in such a way that uh, Africa will continue even in this uh, era of globalization. That's one. Secondly, um, if you look at the brain drain that is also uh, going on, can we say that Africa is not also contributing to global development? And then why is it not transcending back home? Reason is that if we look at the structural uh, 
um, the structure within which African nations are, are you know, uh, what happens structurally in Africa, you find that we'll continue to have this problem. So no amount of diaspora remittances can ever be, you know, uh, sustainable in terms of encouraging development because why? Of the kind of system we talked about corruption. What about the individuals, the society with which morality actually has become, you know, a problem? So morality plays a major role. So in Africa, whether work ethics is more or less about morality. So, so I think if we look at the structural imbalance, that will be able to also give us an insight into what uh, is responsible for some of these development problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Emina. Um, uh, let me now have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Demo Kaladen, Professor Musiba, who you about to follow. Please let us have them quickly. Then after thank this, you. Uh, yeah. th th thank you. Thank you for keeping us engaged. Uh, each time I listen to this webinar series, you know, we get uh, highly encouraged and uh, you know, it keeps us on our toes to look at some perspectives of other areas. I just put to perspective two things, and it has to do with um, seasonality. Being an agrarian person, I feel that I should maybe correct a notion of uh, saying that most of our works are seasonal. The While it is seasonal, heavily seasonal, you know, in the rainy seasons, but activities also go on off season. For example, even in the Igbo land, I know you harvest palm fruits, you harvest um, other things, or you prepare seeds that are going to go to the, to, to the field, but largely dependent more in the rainy seasons than in the off seasons. And there are some, some of these activities that do go on uh, almost continuously, rearing goats and other activities. But what I would want to maybe draw attention or, you know, uh, and pardon me, I'm also a scientist and, you know, uh, would want to look at it, you know, uh, based on real data, is the fact that if we create the same working environment um, in our institutions or in the various sectors, what would, what would it look like? For example, if we are looking at work ethics you know, of uh, diasporans who have uh, worked in an institution outside Nigeria and they are back home. And then suddenly you want to go into the laboratory. Professor, you don't have the your, your line is breaking, sir. Oh, sorry, I hope you can hear me now. Okay, better now. Yeah, if we can have, you know, similar work environments, you know, uh, wouldn't the work ethics, uh, are we likely not to have similar work ethics? If, for example, you know, in the National Open University, you know, you, uh, going into the laboratory, you have 24 hours electricity, are you not likely to see more of your scientists spending 18 hours in the laboratory? That is just the thought. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Then, uh, Professor Musiba or Yebode, can you please make your points? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sorry, my network has not been stable, and uh, I just expect that there should be some specifics about uh, attitude and behavior of diaspora. Especially, we know that people go there to make money, and in order for you to make money, you have to have some tricks that we... He has, like he said, he has challenge with his um, network. So, meanwhile, maybe Dr. Mazu can start to address some of the question flash observations so that when he comes back he will make his own points i will begin with the responding to the former vice chancellor professor abdallah Badamo. uh he made a point where he was asking for about the process of assimilation the process of assimilating our people into uh, the system, American system, you know, so that how do they learn the work ethics of American people? Now, my network you, went off. So the process of assimilation into the American system is a long, it's a long route. So you don't just appear here and then you get inserted into their system so so that you begin to contribute. You know, 
they have a system and they, they want you to undergo training on these systems in the course of which you imbibe their work ethics, you understand what their system is all about, everything. Even common driving, to be a driver here, there are so much ethics of driving. I know what I went through to be able to secure a driving uh, uh, license because they want you to understand what the system is all about and then how it functions so that you will be able to function and think in the way that they think and think in the way that they think, both structurally and then morally. So it takes a long time and for you to be able to get assimilated. So that's why when uh, uh, our people are here, so it doesn't make, the, there's no difference whether you're a Ghanaian or a Nigerian, once you're here, there is a system. You look at that system. If you cannot operate or function within that system, you are out of the system. So you must be able to condition yourself in such a way that you function. There are, there are so many of our people who couldn't do that. And that's why you see so many of our people engaging in crime, engaging in uh, drug and all that. These were people who were not able to insert themselves into this system successfully. Now, the, the, uh, uh, Professor Abdullah also talked about uh, raw data, you know, he, he complained that uh, I didn't have uh, data on some of these things. Well, yes, I, I appreciate the importance of data. I appreciate the importance of data, but uh, I think uh, philosophy, our duty basically is to reflect on these things. Our duty is to generate what you call hypothesis. That, that, that is the, the nature of philosophical research. We generate hypotheses, and then as scientists also, when you are working, you you start from this hypothesis, and when you when you generate it, you start testing you know, to see the one that uh, that works. But the philosopher's duty is to reason out these hypotheses and then present them. You know, so that's why you know, I, I, I didn't pay so much attention to raw data, to raw data. You know, in real philosophical research, those people that I talk to. Uh, they actually don't matter so much. They don't matter so much, you know, but because I know I will also be interacting with scientists and then um, all, all other people that I need to present this. Yes, uh, Professor Abdallah also mentioned, uh, yeah, he, he recognized that I talked about work ethics, protestant work ethics of, uh, of uh, Max Weber. And uh, I didn't mention it, uh, but then strikingly, what he said, the, 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 the theoretical background she said was lacking. He mentioned it, he said the human condition. Yes, if you remember, I mentioned Anna Arendt. I said, with the winning or decline of religious ethics, we are now, people are now looking at non theistic ethics, ethics that is rested on reason. The, 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 the person who I use her own ethics of work to buttress this, the, the person is Anna Arendt. Surprisingly, Arendt's work is entitled Human Condition. So once, uh, and uh, it, it, it's my mistake that I didn't mention the title of that work. If I did, I'm sure Professor Bala would have asked this question, but it's also striking that he went straight to what that topic should be without knowing about it. So the, the, the book is a Human Condition, and it is in that human condition that he established an ethics of work that it is one that must evolve from human condition to make sense to human beings. No longer the way that uh, Max Weber theorizes it, that it is something that comes from, you know, the promise that God gave to believers. So if you're a believer, if you are saved, you must be successful on earth. That is the proof. So people work hard to be successful so that they will at least show other people that I'm among the chosen. When I die, I'm going to heaven. That was what the way Weber described uh, describe it. Now, the form obviously also asks about the identity of diaspora children. Diaspora children, whether they are Nigerian. The truth is, when, when you get into diaspora Nigerian families, 
You see some of them, some of the children, they will tell you, yes, even in the class, I meet some of them, they will tell you, yes, my dad is Nigerian, I'm an American. You know, so his dad is a Nigerian, he's American. Her mother is Nigerian, he's American. Now you see somebody also who has, maybe the father is from Nigeria, the mother is from Gambia. She will tell you, my father is Nigerian, my mother is Gambian, I'm an American, you know? So they have no, no attachment. They have no attachment. And I, I gave one example also with the basketball player who was telling Nigerian players to go back to your shithole shit country. This girl's origin or the origin of her parents were Nigeria or it's Nigeria. But then she didn't care for her. It's not her country. She has nothing to do with it. She was facing Nigerians and then telling Nigerians to go back to their shit home country. So the, 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 the spoiler children, and that, that's also part of the fear. That's also part of the fear that children who are born in this country, they may never return. <laughs> they may never return. Okay, their parents may try to return when they get old. But these children may never return. And then there is not so much incentive to return. That's actually part of the argument. If we begin to, to develop our place, if we begin to become competitive, just like other nations, they, they will have incentive. They will have incentive to return. You know, I met, I met one man, he was almost crying. He told me he came to America in 1984. And then that he's here, but he can't go back. He wants to go back. But what is he going back to? There won't be light, there won't be so many things. And then how, how will he cope? So he was scared, but right in his mind, he wants to go back. He has beautiful ideas, big ideas about how to save Nigeria, how to prosper Nigeria. But he says, look, I can't take them back. I can't take these things back. And then also uh, there is a, on Saturday, on Saturday with the Dr. Rakia, we, we attended a function because uh, uh, a member of uh, Professor Tijani's office in, uh, in Morgan here invited us to a function in his house, International Affairs of Morgan State University. So we went, the, the guy is a Ghanaian, and he said he came to America in 1974, 75, as a student. Now, he was telling us, look, if you go back to Nigeria, you may not stay up to two years and you will come back. So we were like, what? why do you say so? He said, when you get back, you will discover that people are too different. That the things you have learned here, you want to put them in place in Nigeria, the people will oppose you. And if you're a person of conscience who really want to satisfy yourself, you will run back. You know, so this, this is his postulation. And this is also why so many of our people are not coming back because they think they have these ideas, you know, but once they come, they, they, they look out of place. They look out of place, you know, and uh, okay. So culture of Africans, when they arrive, when they, when they arrive uh, uh, in Nigeria, in Africa, that's what I just explained, that that's what the situation is. They're, they're also confused about how to navigate the African environments, the African situation once they, they return. Yes, Professor uh, Uduma, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic also raised his question about my Akajaja <laughs> position as uh, being the foundation of ethics. I, I actually didn't just say Igbo. You know, I, I use it to buttress. It could be the same thing all over Nigeria for, uh, you know, all I care. I remember the last person that presented two weeks ago, Father Arejoko, you know, he, he says so many beautiful things about the Igbo society. And I remember the very, very, when uh, Professor Abdullah made his contribution, he said, look, all these beautiful things you said about the Igbo, these are also what I know about the Fulani. These are also what I know about the house. You know, so that, that tells you that without knowing it, we share some of these things. We share some of these things. The, 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 the Igbo is seasonal. The Fulani is also seasonal. The Hausa is seasonal. The Yoruba. So that you see it, there is no place. No place 
in Nigeria, for instance, uh, I, 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 I want to remember the, 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 the items that are seasonal. You know, that we produce them in season and out of season, the same quantity, the same quality, you know, all over. We do not have such a system in Nigeria. In fact, companies at, at, at some points in the year will shut down, waiting for when, that is a, a, a production companies, will shut down, waiting for the period when they will get the raw materials from the, from the farms. Now, the point is that we are still heavily wedded to our traditional production system or production process. So to be able to compete in the modern world, we need to move out of that process. And then the Akadia theory, uh, definitely. <laughs> Prof spoke like a philosopher, definitely. It, it's not a dogma. It is something that we must keep reasoning and reasoning and talking about. But if we have also read other Igbo books, like uh, Chinua Chebe's Things Fall Apart, you will remember. Uh, Okonkwo's father, the Onoka of a man, you know, during the uh, dry season, when people are harvesting, now Achebe shows that during dry season, people stay more at home because they don't go to work. But during the rainy season, this is an anthropology, anthropology of Igbo society. During the rainy season, that work, producing, cultivating. But during the, 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 the harvest period, that is the happiest moment of Onoka because that's when he will get the food that he needs. For him, this is his own season. But then the season when farmers go to the farm, he is not a farmer, he, so he, he doesn't go to the farm. He stays waiting for his own season also to begin to do his own work. So he's purely seasonal. We can give philosophical interpretations and then they're open to debate and uh, argument. Yes, Nigerian economy is, is so far, if, if you see what is happening here, if you see I'm what- Sorry, Dr. Omazu, I wanted to make it a little faster now. Okay. Because uh, okay. our time is fast spent and the internet and NEPA is not trending. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Now, Dr. Emina's question, he talked about uh, dependency theory and uh, he, he thinks that we are perpetually tied down, we are perpetually, Trapped. There is nothing we can do. That is not true. Look, China was colonized the way we were colonized. Uh, India was colonized the way we were colonized. South Korea was that same way and all that. You know, what the, the lady I told you I met on, Saturday, on, on Monday, on Monday, two days ago, while I was discussing with her, she told me she was in a conference in uh, Uganda and somebody, an African, was making a case was accusing China of colonizing them the second time, making them to be dependent on them, that Chinese will come, they will come with everything, come with equipment, come with money, come with level. And this, that every person is dominating them. The lady said, well, that when she spoke, what she said, look, in the past, Europe came and dominated you. Now, in today, 2022, you are complaining that China is, dominated, is dominating you. So why can't we dominate? You know, why can't we dominate? Are we just meant to be complaining and, uh, you know, talking about domination by others and others? Why can't we dominate? And how do we dominate? By the work that we do. In the university where we teach, nobody's dominating us. There is no Chinese, there are no American. There. It is all of us, Nigerians, who are there. There's no domination. So we just do our own thing and then if we do it well and then get it well, we will get where we want to go. Then, okay, Professor Kala. Prof, sorry, I, I, I hope I got the name very well, you know. I'm, uh, yes. Very, very, said, very well, thank you. Okay, sir. You, you, you said that uh, we have uh, also some things that are seasonal. You're yeah, right. You mentioned palm fruits that there are, you know, these ones are not seasonal that we have and then almost every period of it. You're yeah, right. But then, look, people who dominate the world are people who have been able to tamper with nature, to conquer nature. To conquer nature. Now, the palm fruit you are talking about is not because of our own making. It comes in season and out of season. Like I, I, I come from an area where you have uh, so many palm fruits. I know that from between March 
February, March, April, May, there is heavy harvest of palm fruit. But by, by, by June, July, August, up to December, January, you know, it reduces. Now, but we'll keep harvesting, but the, the frequency is not the same. So why we will not be able to harvest in the same manner, the same system, the same amount of palm fruit throughout the year? So that's the question. And then you, you're also thinking that uh, if we have similar work environment, we will also be able to deliver as Americans have delivered. True, sir. I agree with you, Paul. But then, who will create the work environment that we are talking about? So the fact that we are not still able to create it, it is our own nature. The Nepal people are Nigerians. You go to you go to hospital, you know, the way they behave, the people you meet there are Nigerians. So who else will create the working environment for us? We are in noun. We create the, our own working environment. We want to make it peaceful. We want to make it a place that every person, but we are not expecting Americans to do that for us. So that, 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 that's the argument. Okay, Dr. Yobo, okay, I thought you typed something. I, I didn't see anything. So, thank you. Thank you so much, but there are two comments here on the, on the chat. On the chat. Yes, but it's privately sent uh, from Dr. Ewerem. Uh, I think his concern is, uh, for instance, out of eight hours, uh, out of eight hours of work, how many of that is fully utilized by workers in the station where most workers use for prayers and other break hours that are not accounted for or monitored? Could you please consider this apart from the unstructured work among the which you looked at. Thanks, Dr. Chooks. Oh, you know, I congratulated you. I just put the place, just read that the father has a, a the concern or question. And then but, 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 uh, I think I, I uh, Dr. Sokala. Your line was breaking, my, so I, I didn't pick what Ewerem asked very well. Sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Okay, for instance, out of the eight hours of work in a day, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Eight hours of work in a day, how many of that is fully utilized by workers in a situation where most workers use their time for prayers and other break hours that are not accounted for or monitored, etc.? Could you please consider this uh, this apart from the unstructured work among the informal sector, which you looked at. Thanks, okay. Dr. I don't know whether you got me now. But, uh, yes, yes, my dear. And I think uh, Professor Kala, I, I want to believe that what you wrote here has already asked. Am I right, Professor Kala? Uh, you want it read out? Okay, I think he's not with us or he's not hearing me. Uh, then I don't know, Professor Danny. Uh, well, you can read it out. Yeah, you know, because, uh, it may just add some value. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Cordato, so what were you I asking? You're asking me a question. Alaska. Yeah, you're asking me a question, or you made a comment about me, or you want no, to no, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, I didn't ask you. I was saying, Professor okay. Danny okay. Sorry. is in the house. Ah. I want him to say something because he's the leader of Dr. Eric. And uh, it has been the pioneer um, oh. director right. of this center. So it will not be complete if he me. doesn't say something to Dr. Uh, Omaz, uh, say something about Dr. Omazi's uh, presentation. But before. Well, Eric, part of non diaspora Wahala is there is no electricity now. <laughs> they brought the light for 10 minutes and then they took it off. As always, it's seasonal. They are waiting for the season. To very, it. very seasonal. Yeah. Okay. Can I respond now to what I'm stuff? Uh, not really. Yeah. It's an observation, and I agree with him. But before then, sorry, uh, Professor Tijana, I didn't see you when I started speaking. Prof, my greetings to you. No, he's around. He's around. Uh, Professor Tijani, okay. please. Are you in the house? Okay. I can't hear him. I can't see him. But I know he's, uh, let me check whether he's here. I know we go ahead. Okay, it looks like he's no more. So let us uh, conclude. It looks like 
Professor Tijani is no more around, but he was around. So I, I was trying to read out what uh, Professor Kala talked about. Can you, did you tell me, Dr. No. Eric? No, I didn't hear so that. So can I read this out? Can I read that, uh, Professor Kala's uh, something else? You can, ma, you can. He said, we continue. At the end, says India and China and Korea became competitive by first ignoring Western propaganda. So that means we have to get serious and face our own thing and mm. forget about what people are saying about us, perhaps. That's what the prophet is trying to tell us. Exactly, exactly. I, 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 agree. I agree with Prof on that. I agree with Prof on that, but then I disagree with him saying, uh, you know, that we are looking so much at nations that have had so many years and then we mustn't, the advantage we have is that we mustn't pass through the processes of change or progress that these nations uh, underwent before they arrived where they, they, they have done it. So we are not supposed to repeat what they did in the past. Where we met them, we joined there and then take off. For instance, let, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Somebody told me that if you are if you are a government worker in this country and you drive Japanese car or any other car that is not American made car, they look at you as as a saboteur. You are sabotaging the system. Somebody told me that there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. but these are mainly people who. Are, but how many of us are driving innocent vehicles? Uh, this is Nigerian made cars. These are things that will generate the income for us and they generate employment, generate money, generate this. We, we don't think about that. This is what great nations think, the way they think. But Eric, sorry no. to interrupt you. The, the fact is all these Japanese, Koreans, uh, uh, Chinese, they share one fundamental characteristic that we don't have. Okay. They have singular mindsets. Very, very important, singular mindsets. So they mm. share singular ethics. They share singular morality. Mm. Here in Nigeria, we have 500 different mindsets. <laughs> Every language set is a mindset. We have 500 language, languages and therefore 500 mindsets. Mm. Getting them to coordinate and walk and see eye to eye and move together as one is not difficult. It is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I heard you, sir. I heard you, sir. But I take you back again to your to I take you back again to your point. The, the last time during the last presentation, this guy made his presentation about the Igbo culture. You came and told him exactly all these things you said about the Igbo culture are what is obtainable among the Fulani. It is they are also what are obtainable among other ethnic groups in Nigeria. Look. I have read so much about you know, African philosophy, for instance, so that where we look at the thought system, the thought processes of the African people, they are basically the same. Forget when they tell you we can't unite, we can't do this. We think basically the same way as Africans. We do. Well, let me, let me, let me just maintain it in, as Nigerians. We do. But maybe because we are lazy, we, we, we have not been able to factor how to merge ourselves or mesh ourselves together. We think that we are too different from one another. We are not. We are, we not. are not. When it when it comes to corruption, we are, we are the same. It doesn't matter whether you are Muslim or Northerner or Christian or whatever it is. Now they do. But Eric, social integration is absolutely virtually impossible in this country. That matter, mm -hmm. I know. That's the truth. Like you said, we are, we are discussing philosophy. <laughs> okay. It's been a beautiful day. I really appreciate everyone, and especially I thank the presenter for this beautiful presentation that generated many questions and contributions. It shows that it was quite interesting, and uh, it's a topical issue. I also thank all my colleagues. I was trying to remember Dr. Adsoye, who is always here, 247, and uh, always giving me some uh, moral support. And many of my colleagues are here. I can see Dr. Aleros, uh, Akujobi, so many, too numerous to mention. I know that at this very uh, presentation, we had almost 40 people who logged on, and now we have uh, about 80 or less now. So it's been a long day, and I really appreciate it.
I appreciate your contributions and I am happy that we are trying to turn up now and I want us to continue so that when we are many here, we can rub mess together and get good ideas and educate the people and have a, what we can record that this platform is a sharing knowledge as it should. Next two weeks, we are now going to have somebody in the diaspora. Before, if, if you notice, the last presentation was from diaspora, and uh, Eric is from diaspora. <laughs> so this time around, we are coming to our own soil, Nigeria. But the person may not take us to diaspora, or what I'm saying is that we are coming to Nigeria. So we are going to have the group presenter outside our own university, but in Nigeria. And so I want all of us to make it a day because it's going to be a very interesting topic, and I guess the present. We do justice to it. So thank you so much. Thank you all. And then I want to say bye-bye at this point. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.